All right, it is 5.05. Okay, everybody, let's begin our Committee of the Whole. We have approval of the minutes from our Committee of the Whole from October 18th, 2022. Um, if there are no corrections or concerns, I take a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the Committee of the Whole minutes uh, for October 18th, 2022. Excellent. I second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Aye. All right, discussion items. Wasatch Front Waste and Recycling District 2023 tentative budget and fee increase reports. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, Perfect. Welcome, Pam and Paul. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, come on up. All right, thank you for having us. We appreciate being here. Uh, we've been making, uh, taking our show on the road, uh, visiting all the municipal councils in the district, all 14, uh, and uh, happy to be here with Murray City. And as you may know, we service about 2,800 homes in Murray City that are in the annex portion of the city, but still within our district. Um, and I do have to say that this report having the word tentative in it is out of date already because we did have our public hearing last night um, and the board did adopt the the uh, 2023 budget and the fee increases that were associated with that and i'm going to get through the report to give you all the details of the why we needed to raise rates so i will just start off and okay i think here we go there we go so um, to talk about our budget priorities, we as staff started working with the board looking at uh, future uh, cost projections. And just so you know, we have not raised rates since 2018. It's been five years since we needed to pass on a fee increase to um, manage our increased costs for doing business. I think we can all understand that everything has gone up. Um, the CPI is... I think 8.7 or something of that nature is quite high. Um, and Paul will get into the the work of art that he put together on the next page going through um, the five largest costing centers that we experience and how that's gone up and projected to go up in 2023. Um, we t started talking to the board about we either need to pass on a fee increase or we need to reduce services. And the residents in the district, and so you'll know all of our board members are residents in the district with the exception of a couple, but everyone um, comes to the table speaking on behalf of the residents that we service. Um, and that was resoundingly, we do not want to reduce any of our services. So we're continuing on with weekly garbage, which we're mandated to provide. We have to provide a, a garbage can for every home in the district. That's under state statute and health code. And then health code also says we have to go buy and, and pick up that can or at least go by the home and provide that service uh, weekly. Uh, the, we also provide a weekly recycling collections, which our res residents have said they want to keep. Um, we have seasonal services with a central leaf bag collections, curbside Christmas tree. Uh, we have central glass collections that we provide with seven sites throughout the district. We also provide a curbside glass um, subscription, but that's not part of this monthly fee, but I did want to kind of put a plug in for that. Um, discount tra trailer rental for bulk and green waste, and I think, oh, I did something. There we go. Um, I think that the city does provide your own green waste trailers for residents to rent that are in the other portion of the city, uh, and then we also offer a bulk cleanup. We do have some fee increases associated with those, which are um, $15 for the um, bulk trailer moving from uh, two, excuse me, 175 to 190 and that's parked on the resident's property for four days, and they can load it up and we'll haul it off to the transfer station or to the landfill. We have the green program, same thing, four days. Um, that's moving from $45 to $55. Uh, and these, these fee increases, by the way, will start January 1. We're on a calendar year budget. Um, and the other thing that we offer is the seasonal container reservation program. That's where we used to drop the containers in the streets. 
Um, but due to staffing levels, we, we had to change that. Um, so staffing was the main thing with CDL drivers and having driver shortages nationwide in every industry. We're not the only ones that experience this. Um, and then in 2020, with COVID coming on, that's when I asked for a request to change the way we deliver those containers. And it now goes on the resident's property, and it's by reservation. But it is part of that monthly fee. We have a container repair replacement. I know the city does your own with your um, other 9,000 homes in, in the city. Uh, we have that as well, and uh, that's also included. We offer landfill vouchers for residents in the in the district as well. That's for them to haul their own car, truck, or trailer load to the landfill, and we pay for that fee. Um, and looking at sustaining all of these services, we did need to look at fee. Uh, increased scenarios and Paul put together some great information for the board to look at what would two dollars a month do for for the cash balances going forward what would 250 per month do and three dollars um, the 250 looked like it would be something that hopefully our residents can manage going forward and then also it would sustain us um, hopefully for a few more years at least before we'd have to look at another fee increase um, so the, the fee right now is $17 a month, uh, $51 a quarter right now, and we bill on a quarterly basis. We don't do monthly to try to help to save costs for printing and mailing and also receiving cash uh, or credit card payments or checks. There are fees that go along with that that we don't, that's also included in this, this monthly fee that we charge. I should have listed that one. But we, we absorb that. Um, and so those fees will move from nine to nineteen fifty per month, fifty eight fifty per quarter, and two hundred and thirty four annually. So it is a thirty dollar annual increase. Um, as I mentioned, the last fee increase was five years ago. So this is a fifteen percent increase, and if you look at it it's three percent every year. Um, if you want to look at it broken out per year. Uh, we have uh, a little explanation there about the town of Brighton, just so you know, their fees are going to go up as well. They have not experienced a fee increase for a number of years. We provide a different level of service for the residents in the town of Brighton and Big Cottonwood with front load containers and a garbage compactor. They receive no curbside services whatsoever. As you can imagine, that would be quite a challenge up there. Um, and then I mentioned that we have other fee increases. Um, the board also asked us to bring forward information about what we've done as staff to try to absorb a co costs over the years and to keep our cost as low as possible. And so the two that I have here are just a couple of samples. Um, I gave them quite a lengthy explanation, but these two I think are the most significant. We implemented the use of technologies on our trucks back, starting back in 2018 with the use of GPS systems and GIS systems for routing and mapping to really um, emphasize efficiencies on the routes that our drivers run and trying to make sure that they are going the most efficient way to do the service. We also have forward-facing cameras that have saved us on false claims, uh, property claims or liability claims that we might get from the public um, of act accusing us of damaging their car and we have video footage of our truck going by and the damage is already there so it does save us for that um, uh, unfortunately we do have those situations uh, but it does help we are fully insured but how we would end up paying for that of course is the policy right that we would have to get passed on to us um, the other thing that I want to tout is our environmental stewardship and financial stewardship goal of the use of compressed natural gas. So we tried to, we started looking at alternative fuel use back in 20, I'm gonna age myself here. I've been with the district uh, for 15 years, by the way. Um, but we started looking at shifting from diesel fuel back in 2011 and started that process in 2013, purchasing our first CNG trucks. Uh, there is a little bit of a cost difference, a little bit more money is invested in that, but we recoup that within the first three years um, on the price of fuel. Diesel's more money per gallon, more price per gallon than, it, than CNG. 
And so the projections for 2023, um, we've been quoted at, at at least $4 a gallon for diesel and $2 a gallon for CNG. We purchase a half a million gallons of fuel every year, no matter what type it is, um, because those big trucks that go through your neighborhoods get about, they get less than two gallons, uh, two miles per gallon, just so you know. Uh, and then Paul can get into the purchase price. Garbage is expensive, uh, as you'll see. But anyway, we're gonna save at least a million dollars next year. And we have had savings over the years. Uh, and then uh, always looking for ways to improve efficiencies and then um, working to expand the use of that seasonal container reservation to more residents if we can. If there's no questions at this point, I'll move on to the next page. Get into the finances, the nitty gritty. Paul? Good evening, my name is Paul Korth. I'm the finance director of Wasatch Front Waste and Recycling District. It might be afternoon, but it feels like evening when it gets dark early and it's cold, so we'll call it evening. But what, what I wanted to do here was just recap some of the major expenses and major expense categories. This is not our complete budget, what you're looking at, but it is the main categories and show the fluctuation in the history there over the time frame since our last fee increase. And so there was a fee increase, as Pam mentioned, in 2018. And then we had our budget, our estimate for 2022, and then also the budget for 2023. But just looking at these main categories, wages and overtime, uh, 4.2 million in 2018, 5.3 million approximately in 2021. And then next year we're budgeting 6.6 .6 million. And so, uh, we have had, a since I've been there, a couple wage and salary surveys done by an outside consultant and looked at that, trying to stay competitive to where we're at in the market, as Pam mentioned. We still have a struggle attracting and retaining drivers. And for our equipment operators, in 2018, our average starting wage was $17.34. We also, another thing we implemented was paying for experience, and so that was part of it too. But in 2022, through the first part of the year, we the average equipment operator started, the ones we hired at $24.19. So it really went up from $17 to 24. And then also, I stress that's still making it challenging for us. We're gonna have another increase here coming up in 2023, but it's just a really competitive market out there for CDL drivers. And we'll see you know, if that continues to hold or what happens economically. The next category is fuel. And we can see this one, 971,000 uh, decreased for a couple of years up to 983, and then it shot up fairly significantly this year. I don't think I'm telling anyone here anything new that uh, fuel is up you know, across the board. And uh, we have diesel in, in a few of our trucks, most of our, our side load trucks, and now the two front load trucks, we bought all of our side load fleet, feed, fleet I should say, is a CNG. And so that's been a savings for us on the fuel side. But it's, it's volatile, and then the question is, where is it going to be in the future? And you look at that and you try to estimate or project it, and uh, we had a 5% increase in fuel. I don't know. Is that going to be low or high? I, I'm not sure. I read and I try to stay up. I, economics interests me. I follow the Federal Reserve. I watch that kind of stuff. And the more I read and study it and try to understand, the more I've decided no one knows for sure. So <laughs> it's just, and that's one thing that kind of motivated us for a fee increase. Uh, the next category is maintenance expense, 2.6 million in 2018, up to 3 million in 2021. And then we're looking at about 3.1 for this year and 3.4 next year. That's about an 8% increase we budgeted. We talked with our provider and they were they were anticipating that and think that's an accurate number. A lot of that's parts and, and freight for the parts and then also their uh, labor issues and increasing wages too as far as from their viewpoint. The disposal fees, I included this in here even though it hasn't increased much. In fact, uh, we may have a slight increase this year, but I just wanted to show it. It's a main category. Uh, that's due to a couple reasons. Our, our tons have not increased. They increased, I think, in 2020 during the height of the pandemic. 
and then they've decreased just slightly so we haven't had a, a significant increase in tons taken as far as refuse goes and then also the other item that's the other factor that's helped us is we, we got a contract with salt lake county we uh, dispose a lot of our refuse there and if we take it to the landfill we get a discounted rate and that did help us out reduce the overall cost of refuse so for salt lake county we take some of it to the transfer station and some of it to the landfill and if we go to the landfill we get a significantly lower rate but we still want to take into account where we picking it up at we don't want to drive a lot of extra miles to get that extra weight rate and then you've used up the benefit of it so we do consider that the next one to me is really interesting recycling 894,000 in 2018 we can see it went up to 1.3 uh, about 1.1 million last year, 331,000. Uh, so just about a million dollar decrease. Uh, this year, we've started to see an increase, a significant increase in recycling costs the last couple months. And this is just the cost that we pay the vendor to process it. The other recycling costs, for example, wages and overtime fuel and maintenance are in those categories. But this is the cost we pay. But that's one thing, me being I'm going to be conservative and I see recycling in the in the potential for that to really change significantly and fluctuate is we want to keep cash on hand and keep some cash reserves there to cover some of those swings. So, uh, and then we have the total. Uh, this is for the, the, the categories listed here. And then also the cost of a side load pickup. And this one's really interesting to me. Look in 2018, it was 313,000. In 2021, uh, 328,000. Really not much of an increase there. That's really reasonable. Uh, in 2022, they actually started out less than the 351,000. The vendor came back to us and said, hey, we need to bump up your cost. Uh, the cost we quoted you and agreed upon is not going to work for us. We went back to our board, had discussions, uh, got that approved for 351,000. We had ordered eight side load trucks approximately about a year ago. And then we were just told last month we're not going to get those eight side load trucks. So even at the higher cost that we went back and got approval for, uh, they said we're not going to get those. And so right now, uh, from our discussions with our vendors, we're estimating next year is going to be 425,000. And so that's gone up from 328,000 to 425,000 in two years. And so that's really been a significant increase for us. So with some of these costs, what we're looking at is not just what's happened, but we're trying to look at the future too and where we're at. And then how long can this go? That's the question. And, and I don't think it can go forever, but when does it end? And what's the timing of that as far as the price increases? And then we just have, I, I just did based on these increases and in the cost of trucks, uh, the, in, the projected increase for these categories was 3.6 million and divided that by the houses served in the district to get an amount, which is $3.45 monthly. But that includes that last fee increase, which has used that up and then also looking forward. So are there any questions on costs or categories, those type of things? You can go ahead. Um, recycling. We go every other week, correct, for Marie? For your other yes. Uh, yes, yes. Have you thought about going once a month? For us Recycling from going weekly? Instead they of monthly. They do. They do. Weekly. For the other 2,800 Oh, homes. those are, oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, and, and just to answer the question, we, we heard resoundingly from residents they don't want to change the, the weekly. Even when in 2019 we did surveys to say, hey, it's going to be a dollar fifty more per home per month just for recycling, and and the resident said, we'll pay it, and then we ended up not needing to pay uh, or increase fees because we had a um, unfortunately we had the double-edged sword of underexpended personnel because we were short on staff. So it's a double-edged sword when you yeah. absorb in that manner. Yeah. How many people are you still short? Driver wise, I mean, are you guys fully staffed or are you still no, short? No, we're still short. Excuse me, uh, five drivers currently, five equipment operators. And what's that out of a total of Pam? About 60? We have 62 allocations right yeah. now. So 62 people driving trucks? Yes. Yeah. How many um, of the side load trucks go out on a pickup every Tuesday? 
On a Tuesday. Oh, well, in general, I guess how many go out each week? Because not everyone gets Tuesday. Mine is Tuesday. Hey, it's but. about 40 a day, but that includes recycling, refuse, and then green. Okay. We, we service about 40 routes a day, approximately. Great. I'm the only one here, I think, who is who in actually, that area. Yeah. And so Diane's not here. But um, uh, been very happy with everything and all the stuff you mentioned on the initial page. I've utilized almost everything, so including the bins and the bulk. So appreciate all you guys do. Yeah, my residents are very pleased as well. So I have a question about your glass program. How popular is that within that part of the city? The curbside, um, mm -hmm. I believe we just met with Momentum, and they're the ones that provide mm -hmm. the collection. Um, and yesterday they they told us we're up to close to 2,000 district-wide. I believe Murray is is over 100. I can get the exact and get okay. right back. Okay, I'm to curious you. to know. Yeah. Because I know that we could have it within our, like on my side of the city um, through ACE, but I wasn't sure exactly what how popular it is on above Ninth East. So I was just curious to know. Let me get back to you with the exact, yeah, if that's you, okay. You can opt in, yeah. yeah thank it's you. It's a subscription. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next uh, sheet. And this, uh, what I did was put together just looking at cash and our investment balances. And for this purpose, when I look at cash and investments, I include them both together because our investments are liquid. We have access to them and can get them within a day or two if we need access to those funds. And so I do include the investments. And there was changes on this, uh, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. But this is just uh, the bluish gray section is our audited numbers. And so for like for 2019, for example, we start off with beginning cash, add in the truck sales, net proceeds, revenues, less operational expenses, less an adjustment, adjustment for depreciation, and then minus out capital expenditures, which are really primarily uh, truck purchases. Also, I think it was in 2020, we expanded the CNG station and included some more lines there, which would be included in there. But looking at this, uh, the key line is really the third line from the bottom, ending cash and investment balances. And it was 10.5 million in 2019, 10.1 million in 2020, and 9.5 million in 2021. And then we see uh, right now the estimated 2020 is 10.3. And when, when I did this originally and for most of the time, that 10.3 was about oh, approximately $3 million less. And that's because we did not get those eight side load trucks. And then we found out recently we're not going to get our uh, other trucks either like pickups that we use for trailers and so we have not spent uh, much of the budget this year as far as capital expenditures go and that was not because we did not want to it was because we ordered them and were told that they're not available and so i went back and reworked this and i was like well that's the reason because the original one had seven i think 0.4 million there and showed that trend going down and that was uh, part of the reason and motivation to go out for a fee increase but we do and we hope i should say i don't know about anticipate but we hope we can buy more trucks next year and we'll see where we're at on that that works for a year or two unfortunately we have we kept some older ones in our fleet but long term uh, that's not a good strategy and not going to work for us uh, not getting new trucks we've kind of set a target at eight a year and we like i said this year we got zero we did get two new front load trucks which was helpful but this just shows the investment, the ending cash and investment balance, where it's at, and kind of the projection. And once we get out a year or two on the projections, there's a lot of assumptions, and they're always subject to change, I'll be honest. So, you know, it's just what happens at that point in time. But still, if we're going to go out for a fee increase, and I think we take it very seriously, uh, we want to show what's happened and why we're thinking the way we think and why we feel like this is the time to do this. So, any questions? for me on that okay thanks if i may just point out that that paul's uh, analysis both on the previous page and this page is based on an, us expending 94 percent of our budget and looking historically we've always been under budgeted for one reason or another um, so i appreciate him putting that together so we're not over inflating anything uh, and then uh, moving into the next steps and 
you know, apologies, we're a little late getting here after the tentative. Oh, but you're doing great. Yeah. So the public hearing was held last night. There was minimal comment from the public. Uh, as I mentioned, Paul and I have been going out to all the municipal councils. We really didn't receive a lot of pushback. It was a lot of understanding about the why. Um, so we appreciate that very much and the support. And then, as you know, uh, I almost said board member, but council member uh, Turner is our the board member on, uh, representing Murray, and she's been very supportive as well. And I do have all my contact information right there. I'm willing to take any calls, emails, uh, any concerns or compliments or whatever from residents at any time or elected officials. And then please visit our website. Uh, and you can find us wasatchfrontwaste.org and there's lots of information in there about recycling, about our budget, uh, about our board or staff. Thank you. Any questions? No. All right. Thank you, Pam and Paul, for being here and for all of that information. And like I said, nobody likes fee increases, but I think we all understand that it's just a tough time for that. So thank you. You're we welcome. appreciate you. Thank you. All right, next up, discussion on an ordinance amending the general plan from low density residential to neighborhood business and amends the zoning map from R18 to RNB for the property located at 97 West Winchester. Hi, Jared. Oh, absolutely. Right. Um, this is a, a dual, a kind of a dual application. The, um, there are two parts to it, a general plan amendment and a zone map amendment in order to accomplish the, the goal of the applicant in this case. Uh, to, and the ultimate goal is to change the zoning of the property from R18 to RNB. Uh, that's the purpose of the application. Just to give a little bit of background, this property, 97 West Winchester, is located kind of at the corner of Winchester Street and Malstrom, uh, Malstrom Lane. It comes off there. It's just under half an acre, uh, currently used as a, uh, it's a residential home that's been there for a number of years. Um, as I said, it's a dual application because the zoning, as you can see, this is a section from the zoning map, uh, shows that the property is in that uh, R18 zone. As you can see across the street, this is the zone that they're uh, seeking, RNB, Residential Neighborhood Business, and they are, they are different, uh, different zones. This little tiny corner right here was just recently changed to RNB. It hasn't been updated in our zoning map yet, so it still shows as yellow. But that's pink as well, RNB zoning. The general plan um, right now, you can see that this side right here is all in that area for, um, for uh, residential business, which is the category that supports that RNB zoning. And Malstrom Lane right here, you can see is in that low density residential category. Um, the, the applicant has asked, I'm going to stay on this for just a second. The applicant is seeking this, app, uh, this change of zoning so he can operate his property management business from this location. Um, it's a his intent at the moment, and this is all background information that's, that, that's just interesting to have. It's not really um, pertinent to changing the zoning because you have to be okay with whatever could happen in the R&B zone, not just what his intent is, but I wanted to let you know. Uh, his, his purpose is to uh, re remodel the home interior-wise to use it as an office for his staff of six, seven people. Um, it's a property management company, not a maintenance company. So this is office work that they do. They handle billing and uh, move-ins and move-outs for several properties that are owned, residential properties. Um, and that would be his intent, not to remove the building, but that could happen in the future. 
So as we talk about that, uh, the future land use designations that we just mentioned, again, that residential business that they're seeking would support that RNB zone, residential neighborhood business. Let's talk a little bit about that zone. The RNB zone is a specifically, a specifically created zone to function as a transition or a buffer between high density, or sorry, between high traffic corridors, high volume corridors like Winchester Street and residential neighborhoods. So as you look at that mapping, that's, you can see this is a pretty solid residential area and Winchester Street is that volume. All of the frontage of Winchester Street has been general planned to be residential business to allow for those kind of uh, light duty uh, businesses that have limited hours and different uh, design elements that make them more compatible with residential uses. So it's not a standard commercial zone, but it's not a mixed use zone really either. Only in the sense that you can have a single family home in the RNB zone. You can be zoned RNB and have a single family home, no problem. Uh, but you can't mix the two uses on the same site. So if you start to use the site commercially, it goes to commercial, not to residential. Um, some of the things that are different about the two zones, uh, conditional uses um, in both zones require planning commission approval. But in the RNB zone, anything that happens, any new construction that happens is, is required to go through planning commission approval. And that is because of some of the specific uh, standards that are applied to any new construction in that zone. So for example, um, in most zones, we don't have a lot of architectural considerations. In the RNB, you're required to have residential looking buildings. So even if you build an office building, you're supposed to use pitches and gables. You don't, we don't do flat roofs typically. Um, we like to use um, more residential looking windows. So paned glass and punched windows, that kind of thing, not as much window system. Uh, there's some just considerations like that that don't exist in other zones. And that's all part of it being a, a transition zone between residential and commercial. Um, heights in the zone, 35 is allowed in the R18 um, for maximum height. 20 foot is the maximum height in the RNB, although the Planning Commission can approve up to 30. But it's slightly, slightly smaller. And that's again to help achieve kind of a scale. Um, this building that we're sitting in, for example, is out of scale with the RNB. It doesn't fit with a residential neighborhood. So when we see buildings, the, the largest building we've done in the RNB zone was in kind of two sections and the two sections totaled about eight and a half thousand square feet. So we look for smaller buildings that are more scaled for the residential neighborhood. Uh, that's all planning commission controlled. So it's not, it's part of the zoning, but when someone comes in for a new building, it's required to go through that planning commission approval process and they apply all those standards. Um, along with those standards also, we look at uh, moving the building to the street frontage as opposed to behind. That way the parking lot is really what's abutting any neighborhoods or any, any neighboring properties as opposed to the building itself. Um, we do require buffering, so anywhere it's adjacent to residential uses and, and zones, uh, it's required to have 10 feet of landscaping buffer with a six foot uh, masonry fence. The Planning Commission oftentimes pushes that to eight foot uh, in height to, to, to provide an additional buffer. Um, and there are hours of operation that are limited to. You can't operate between, you can only operate between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. in this zone. And most of the uses we've had so far have been office uses that are vacated 5, 30, 6 o'clock at night. I'm trying to think of a, a more retail. We've got a guy that teaches guitar lessons. I don't know that that qualifies as retail. I don't know how late he does those, but not after 10. I know that much for sure. Um, so those are the kinds of uses that you have. Dental offices, uh, attorney's offices, guitar lessons, and now property management potentially. Those are all pretty typical uses that are allowed. It does not allow, it does allow for small restaurants and things, but it doesn't allow for convenience, uh, gas stations, things like that are not allowed in this zone. Um, the staff has recommended that the- Jared, yeah, go can ahead. I ask you a question? Sure. If we turn, we flip this to the R&B mm -hmm. and he decides not to do and sell it, yeah. could a restaurant still go in there? It could. It requires that conditional use review. Um, at 0.48 acres, it's kind of small. It would have to be a very small restaurant. So, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the consideration of this zone, why we would, we would allow a restaurant, but its hours would be limited to no later than 10 o'clock, obviously. And then the size is kind of limiting too. So something smaller, like on the order of the t Rose Diner might fit there, mm -hmm. uh, but you wouldn't be able to do like a Raising Cane's, for example. Oh, the hours yeah. are too late and drive throughs aren't allowed in this right. zone either. So I was just worried about the traffic sure. and the parking. Right, and those are, the, those are the main considerations for this kind of zone. We did receive, um, in relation to public comments, we did have one comment at the public hearing that the Planning Commission held. The Planning Commission voted to, to recommend approval. 
Uh, the one comment that was received in person was from a neighbor who was concerned about traffic yeah. um, and would rather see it just remain R18 zoning. We did receive two questions by email as well. Um, they weren't concerns exactly, they were just questions about, and those questions were raised. What does this do with traffic? What kinds of uses are allowed, et cetera. And I believe Seth, um, this was Seth's project. He's moved on to work for Salt Lake City now. What? Traitor that he is. <laughs> but, <laughs> yep, exactly. But um, I believe he spoke with those applicants, or th sorry, those um, respondents and-, and, and you don't know the what their, re what, what how their they response to that was? Yeah. That I, do I don't know, although I haven't heard from them, so I would assume so those residents could come back and ask you yep. or Zach or Susan? Yep. And we, ha we haven't had any contact with those questions, uh, or those emails that came in since then, since Seth left. So I don't know of any concerns that they still have, but that's okay. what I know. Um, and then the, the public hearing for this at the city council level would be on December 6th coming up. So A question on the okay. map. Um, you mentioned that all the other places with frontage to Winchester yeah. are commercial. Yeah. So the reason that this is con because that's your entry and exit, whereas like 6415 and 111 use that other road as their frontage. Is that the right. distinguishment here? Because this, I think what we did was, and this is, sorry, this is an error in the, in the GIS, but this is all in that pink as well. In that future land use category. They oh, it is already pink. They haven't been rezoned to R and B, but they're in the future. future land use category to allow for that. The future, we will huh. see that. That was my question: is yeah, what areas of this map would be in the future land use? Is right. it one three five, like one Goes four right, five it over? Ends right here. <laughs> so oh, okay. These, these properties that front Winchester Street are all contained in that future land use category for residential business to R&B to R&B and that, okay so this is a natural progression it is so this this mm -hmm. his argument as an applicant was that this would represent a natural expansion of that already determined future land use category one additional property and we accept that as staff as an as a valid argument because Malmstrom Lane kind of provides that hard edge so there it wouldn't make a lot of sense to go further than that um, and you're you're up against I-215 at that point as well. So, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the zoning here. This is the zoning map right here. And you can see that none of them have been changed. Yeah. This is the future land use map segment up here, and it ends right there. So these are your... As we're staring at it. Yep. It's, it looks like one image, right? It does. That's mm -hmm. what confused me. Borders, okay, Seth, yeah. borders. But anyway, this is... So you're looking at the future land use map. These are all in the category to allow them to be supported to change to R&B. None of them have done so yet. Well, the north side has actually all been rezoned. Is there a, any lots that are for sale in that area already? Like is 6415 for sale or 6427? I wish I knew. I don't know. I'm sorry. Well, according to the notes, Mr. Smallwood said that there are a few properties just west of this one that are for sale. I don't know how, what, how far west those are or which ones they are. Okay. So if that was the case and then they came back and said, I want to rezone again. What are s I'm sorry, rezone again to rezone to any type of other commercial. Well, I mean, the only commercial that's supported by the future land use map here, though, is R1 is R1 and it's only okay. that transition. Zone. Okay, general commercial has not been supported here in the future land use map, just the transition zone. Okay, I, I mean, I'm just foreseeing in the future. This is we have fashion area plan coming, yeah. we have we want this to be more of a walkable community. I mean, we can see something that different could, in the that future could bring for sure. Changes. I think in the in the minutes, you'll if you read the minutes, you'll see Zach talking to the planning commission and saying this yeah. actually this request conforms more to the 2017 general plan than it does to the fashion place west small area plan, which says, well, maybe we ought to look at sort of light duty mixed use categories for this area. We don't have any of those written for this right. area, so. This is kind of conforming to the 2017 plan, which is a little bit outpaced by the Fashion Place West. Right. Okay. And we're going to redo that one in the next two years, too. And then... 462. I know you went over some of the conditional uses. Is there any other uses that we... That could... They could possibly... Um, it's mostly offices and small restaurants. And, okay. And light, light retail. So there are limits on how much square footage you can have for those in the code. They can't be large buildings and we're supposed to take into account as the planning commission looks at these new buildings or new construction it, it kind of goes down in 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 waves the first line is to say if 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 somebody wants to keep a single family home that's been there and convert it then that's the first preference we'd like to support them doing that um, if that's not possible then we want to see sort of neighborhood scaled um, properties so uh, 
across the street, the Planning Commission allowed, you can kind of see these buildings here. Those are two-story offices. Those are larger than anything else we've permitted in in this zone. So they wouldn't be higher than two stories yeah, necessarily. They, okay. Two stories is your limit and never more than 30 feet. These are different because they're, they look residential. They have some residential features, but they are flat roofed. This was one of the first ones the Planning Commission approved. Mm -hmm. And because it was sort of isolated and a large piece and backs up to 215, uh, they allowed more, um, more commercial look to that. Um, the site looks more commercial than anything else we have in the R&B. Most of them, and I, the pictures aren't in your slides, I apologize, but several of them are converted homes. Uh, lots of them, if they're not converted homes, they're about the size of a, of a modern larger home. They're not big, big places in the R&B zone. The, the other you. largest one we have is the Advocates building up on, if you go up mm -hmm. to 725 East in Winchester. It's like three stories. That's only two. Oh, that's two? Yeah, that's a two-story building as well. Okay. Um, but it's, it's got kind of two segments to the building, so. Mm. Uh, I hope that answered your question, sorry. No, it did, thank you so much. Um, any other questions? All right. Oh, I do. Are, are you done? Oh, no, go ahead, yeah. Oh, oh, I do. This is my area. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is Mr. Henderson here? He is not. I spoke with him earlier. We had advised him that the public hearing was the 6th, and that's where we would expect him. Okay. That typically, because typically the council hasn't wanted to speak with the applicants during Committee of the Whole. So okay. he had not planned on being here tonight, but he is planning to be here on the 6th. Okay. I just have some concerns mm -hmm. on the size and what he could do eventually with that piece of property from reading the residents. Mm -hmm comments the um, size of the building do you mean or the yeah and the buffering can you explain a little bit more to me on the buffering sure so if let me go back to the aerial so the buffering requirements are anywhere there's the mouse okay got anywhere it. where this property mm -hmm. touches residentially zoned properties we require that 10 foot buffer got it so and since none of these this one is not in the R&B zone or future land use planned for the R&B zone. So this would be a 10 foot buffer okay. and a six or eight foot wall. Okay. This property is still in the R18 zone, although okay. it's general plan for the future to be R&B or so it could be R&B, but right now it's zoned R18. So we would buffer this with 10 feet and a six foot wall as well. So why couldn't he just turn that house and just keep it as a house? Like he, he could. If, so why if, is he looking at it to change to an R&B? because he wants to run a property management office out of it. He can't run the business out of it as Got is. It. Got it. Right. He That's could, right. He could use That's it right. as a house. Yeah, okay. It, and even if he changes, let's say he changed the zoning. Let's say the planning commission. Sorry. Yeah. You guys are the city council, right? Right. There are too many, too many people sit it's in those right. chairs. Right. Um, <laughs> let's say the city council approved this zone change and it was rezoned to R&B mm -hmm. and his plans changed and he decided he didn't want to use it for his office because it wasn't large enough or because the costs to it, it can get costly to make the building code changes that have to be made to a building list to make it compliant for commercial use. Got it. And he changes his mind. He can still then use the property residentially. There's no prohibition on using property residentially, okay. even when it's zoned R&B. So you could zone for R&B and have plans to change it five years down the road when the office market is better or whatever that might be. Okay. So there's nothing to keep him from doing it. I know it's not his plan, but there's nothing to keep him and, from doing and it. And is he, have you had further com, com, conversation with him about um, trucks coming in like yeah he doesn't this isn't the maintenance okay, he's not so a maintenance he's not, company he's because a that little piece of property that is right up against i-215 yep it right says here. no parking in that area even though residents do park in there yeah i'm just concerned that if his people come in and yeah will park over in that area when it says no parking and murray does own that piece of property correct or is it you dot i th i do believe that this is right away that's murray's okay. i can't say that definitively but that's my guess from the way the gis is laid out okay all right but um for parking and things like that I, again i did talk to him about that today okay he's not the maintenance kind of company he's a management company so basically what they do is um they handle leases they arrange the paperwork and leases and vet clients for or vet tenants for a, a client who owns seven or eight properties, residential properties. And those clients will be coming into that area. They generally don't. Oh, they don't. Is, they they handle everything over email and the phone. Every once in a while, someone has to come in to sign a lease here instead of a docu sign, but very rarely. 
clients coming to and from this property are not the plan dealer. This is just where they meet to do their work. Okay. And you said he's going to have between six and... Six and seven people Okay. work for him. And so as you look at this property, I mean, there's going to be some changes he's going to have to make, obviously, to the surrounding parking area. That looks like, and some parking he'll need to put in there. Yeah, the site uh, will have to be redone. In theory, though, under that zone, he can tear the building down and build something he could. that looks neighborhood like mm-hmm. i mean you had to you had a description yeah. but any changes substantial like that have to go through the planning commission they do okay even the site even if he kept the home exactly the same way uh-huh. ex- on the exterior the site work that has to be done would still go through the plan still goes through the planning commission okay because we have to look at where he parks we have to park this building that he keeps yeah and we'd put that parking in the back and redo the landscaping for the buffer in the front etc so okay Hey, Jared, Yeah. the property right behind it, it looks like it's all one property. Here? Yeah. Is that, oh, like, is it the same ownership? No, it's not. Okay, this, so there's a fence this there. This is another, yeah, there's okay. another owner back here at the end okay. of Caleb. I just, I saw the other ones do kind of extend, and I wasn't sure. Yeah, So I thought been, I would ask. That was, car- that was likely carved off years ago, and then used, they used Caleb Place to get to the property back there. I wish I had a okay. more outside aerial. Sorry about that. Fun times. Thank you, Jared. You bet. Any other questions? Thank you for taking my phone call yesterday or two days ago. I appreciate that. No problem. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. Um, and then, yeah, we did. So I don't know if I got to this part, but we did. Rec- we are recommending approval. Did I say that? We're recommending no. approval. Yes, thank right. you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Jared. All right. That is it for our agenda. So if there are no objections, we are adjourned for this Committee of the Whole meeting. Thank you.